Well, here we are, the end of our year-long uh, journey in integrative chaplaincy. Uh, one of the things that I was reflecting on uh, in the last several days, even as I was preparing this video, was what I have uh, gained from this experience. I'd always been kind of interested in labyrinths. It was something, I don't know, different about them. It was an active way to engage in meditation, perhaps. But over the course of the year, my interest has grown and deepened. And in fact, I even uh, wrote a book, uh, published it uh, last month, or actually, yes, last month, in which I uh, used the image and the idea of labyrinth as I explored, <coughs> pardon me, one of the major parables that we find in the Lotus Sutra. Um, I frequently refer to labyrinths as uh, magical and healing. I use the term magic because it is possible to experience a certain magic, a magic of awareness and awakening, as well as insights through the practice of walking a labyrinth. When I use the term walking, I am not limiting labyrinth work to only walking with your legs. It is possible to experience all the wonder and mystery of labyrinths by walking with your fingers as you trace out the path on a handheld labyrinth. Walking can also mean the mental attention that you give to the labyrinth. And at the conclusion of this video, I'll even show you how to draw a couple of labyrinths. Labyrinths can be found in one shape or form in possibly all cultures throughout history. Many people have done some extensive research into that, and that's um, really not my purpose. But I have been kind of interested in how do we connect, or how do we look at labyrinths from the perspective of Buddhism, um, where in our imagery and uh, we don't have any such thing as famous or as noteworthy as, say, the Chartres Cathedral's labyrinth or some of the other labyrinths that are found throughout Europe. But um, perhaps there's a different form of labyrinths in Buddhism. And we might even consider circumambulations that we do around a uh, statue or an image of the Buddha or a representation of a particular um, passage from one of the Buddhist teachings. Chihi, um, in a 5th century Chinese Buddhist scholar, uh, prescribed a, a ritual for lay practitioners which required a certain number of circumambulations around the outside of the uh, practice hall, the building that the practice hall was housed in. And after those certain number of circumambulations were completed, then the practitioner could enter the hall and engage in more circumambulations. Uh, frequently during the repentance and renewal ceremony that we perform called Hoke Sembo, circumambulations are done during the recitation of chapter two from the Lotus Sutra. All of these are in a way a spiritual journey of the body as well as of the spirit. The journey inward and through the Dharma is transcendental as well as transformative. That's kind of been my experience uh, as I have um, worked with labyrinths, as I've taught people about labyrinths, that it is both transcendental and transformative. <coughs> In European Christianity, the labyrinth was frequently found in cathedrals throughout Europe and were walked by pilgrims in place of an actual pilgrimage to the Holy Land, which was frequently unsafe to do because of the Crusades and the wars uh, uh, contesting uh, who was going to control Jerusalem. Pilgrims would make their way to various pilgrimage cathedrals and then walk the labyrinth, which came to symbolize the actual walking to Jerusalem. And in fact, Chartres Cathedral uh, was one of those places. Um, recently, I was able to actually travel uh, to France earlier this year and 
one of my uh, goals for one of the things I wanted to see was the uh, labyrinth at Sharps Cathedral and I have uh, included a couple of photos uh, from um, that labyrinth. Uh, the, that particular labyrinth is actually only open to walking two days a year. The rest of the time it's covered with chairs because Sharp Cathedral is actually an active cathedral where regular services are held. <coughs> but because of the configuration of the labyrinth and the arrangement of the chairs, the center is always open and you can stand in the center. Um, a while back, um, in November of last year, right after we had begun our uh, integrated chaplain course, I um, took a, a personal retreat, uh, spent a week at Mepkin Abbey, which is a Trappist monastery outside of uh, Charleston, uh, located in Monk's Corner, appropriately named. In one of the fields of the, of the monastery complex, there's a huge outdoor labyrinth set up. And uh, the paths, of, as you walk this labyrinth, uh, are planted with wildflowers. Now, in November, all the wildflowers had, had already um, uh, spent their bloom and were dying out. But still, you could just kind of imagine uh, the variety of colors that would be available throughout the summertime to a person who walked that particular labyrinth. And the uh, wildflowers are quite high, in fact, and um, there were many times when you actually could not see the rest of the labyrinth from your path, wherever you were. <coughs> and I've included a picture of the center of that labyrinth, a panoramic picture. It really doesn't do the labyrinth justice. That labyrinth, I don't know the exact size of it, but uh, according to my pedometer, it was roughly one mile in, and so uh, then it was one mile out. Walking as a spiritual practice is found throughout the world in many of the first religions of man. Even the time of the Jew, even the time of the Jews uh, wandering in the desert after their release from bondage in, in Egypt was a journey of purification and preparation for entering the Promised Land. At least that's my understanding. Correct me if I'm wrong. I'm not here to teach Christianity. Also, while not specifically a labyrinth a walk, the slaves of our United States walked and rode on the Underground Railroad to a place of freedom. A couple of years ago, thanks to the wonders of the internet, I was able to follow the progress of a young man who walked from Connecticut to California as he sought to raise awareness for micro-lending. During this walk, he not only increased support for micro-lending, uh, so he was, he was successful in that, but he himself underwent a spiritual transformation. He and his faithful canine companion walked the land, interacting with the silence and stillness of nature, as well as the sometimes harsh realities of weather and the warmth and support and welcome from fellow humans along his path. There are many reasons uh, why someone might consider a labyrinth work. It could be as simple as for relaxation. It could be to unburden oneself from a particular problem. Or it might be to gain some insight into solving a perpetual perplexing life difficulty. In the detox unit of one of the hospitals where I work, I employ labyrinths with patients as simply a way to calm and soothe anxiety that frequently is coupled with those who struggle with addictions. In the Jewish tradition, there is a, um, uh, a mystical writing, uh, if you will, uh, a, a practice called Midrash. Um, which uh, is engaged in to seek a, or to gain a deeper understanding of the truth found in the Torah through looking at what is not written in the scripture. I was kind of taken by that as I um, was working on a project this past year. In different Midrash writings, um, um, 
there are given various numbers of prayers to engage in at different stages of the journey of one's travel. I like to employ this, I like to bring this into doing labyrinth work because I believe it can help prepare our minds, our spirit, if you will, so that it is in alignment with the physical action we are engaging in. Today I will teach you what I call the four prayers of the labyrinth. And this is just my, I guess you could say, invention. This is what I bring to labyrinth work. A prayer of beginning, a prayer of awakening, a prayer of returning, and a prayer of completion and gratitude for gifts received. The per first of the prayers is one, is, is one to pray for a safe journey. For our purposes, let us pray with intention that our reasons for undertaking the journey through the labyrinth will be accomplished. After this prayerful intention setting, one enters the labyrinth. It is perfectly acceptable to take with you some object which may represent a burden you might be carrying if your intention is to unburden your life through the walk. Perhaps you might pick up a stone, or as one person did recently when I taught labyrinths, they picked up a dying leaf, or actually, I guess it was a dead leaf, um, that had fallen to the ground. Whatever you choose to pick up, place as much of your intention into that thing so that it actually becomes the burden you are carrying. Or perhaps you wish to initiate, initiate some action in your life and are using the labyrinth as an activity of new beginning. You might pick up an object which you will carry in and bring out and keep as a constant reminder of your goal or intention. There are many ways in which you may employ the use of a physical object in your labyrinth walk. Now slowly and with as much awareness as possible or with as much mindfulness as possible, begin your walk. As you walk around, you will notice that at first, depending upon the configuration of the labyrinth, that is, you may come very close to the center of the labyrinth, the Chartres Cathedral, for one, <coughs> is that way. There are times in our lives also where we might come very close to achieving our goal, or even when we may think that we have finally overcome some obstacle. Yet, as is the case in the labyrinth, after only a few turns, you find yourself way far away from the center. Frequently in our lives, we may experience setbacks which seem to shunt us further away from our goal than when we started. These can be discouraging times for us. It may even be tempting when we are very close to the outside edge to simply abandon uh, our journey, step across the line, and walk away. One of the reassuring things about a labyrinth, however, is that there's only one way in and one way out. All we need to do is follow the path. A major difference between labyrinths and mazes is that there are no false turns in a labyrinth. In a maze, there are false alleys and wrong turns. Frequently in literature, a maze is also populated with all sorts of potential dangers to overcome. I recently read a story where the hero of the story had to travel through a maze uh, to reach his destination. The danger of this particular maze, though, was that the longer he remained in the labyrinth, the more he forgot. Um, he would soon forget why he was in the maze, then he would forget he was even human, and eventually he would forget that he needed to eat and so would eventually be overcome by the maze and die. So he had to get out of the maze as soon as possible. For most of us, death is not a threat as we walk our labyrinth, but the danger in our lives is frequently we may forget our goal or our objective. We may even forget our spirituality. But in the labyrinth, we only need to follow the path which will eventually lead us to the center and then back out again. You can also think of a labyrinth as the hero's journey of your life. You are the hero of your story, and the path you walk every day is represented to you in the form of the labyrinth, which you are now walking. The path has been walked before by countless others, 
All you need to do is follow in their footsteps by following the path. There will arise many crucial times in your life where it may seem easier to either abandon your journey or even take a shortcut to reach the center. There will be times as you walk the labyrinth when you will only be one step away from the center if you step over a line. It would be so easy to do. No one's watching. Who would know? Yet we all know that the shortcut we may take only deprives us of opportunity for growth and change. You have come so far and learned so much, even experienced many things. Why throw it all away now and limit your journey? Patience and determination will see you through this endeavor. Please do not become discouraged. When you finally reach the center, pause a moment before entering. Offer the second of our four prayers of the labyrinth. And this prayer, express your gratitude for the successful completion of your inward journey, as well as a prayer for opening and awakening to the gifts to be received in the center. Now you may enter the center. In the Lotus Sutra, there's a parable called the Magic City. <coughs> Pardon me. In this parable, a group of uh, travelers wish to go to a special place of great treasure. The road they must travel is very dangerous, and none know the way. They seek out a guide who can lead them to this place they wish to go. The journey is 500 days long, and about halfway, they become tired and discouraged and wish to turn around. The guide, knowing the road and knowing they were halfway, creates a magic city where the people may enter and refresh and renew themselves. After the people have rested and restored their spirits and bodies, the guide causes the magic city to disappear and tells the people they are near their destination. The people then continue on their journey and eventually reach the place of great treasure. Our journey in the labyrinth is similar to this. We reach the center, but we, we cannot remain there forever. Even in life, you may reach your goal Yet, you must continue living and experiencing and growing. Staying in one place is not an option because nothing in our lives remain unchanged. So too, even in the center, there comes a time when we must leave. Before we exit the circle, we now perform our third prayer of the labyrinth. In this third prayer, we express our appreciation for what we have gained or even what we were able to leave behind in the center of the labyrinth. We also pray for a safe journey outward, that we may not become discouraged, or that we are able to overcome any obstacle that may arise. Our exit from the labyrinth will offer its own influence upon what we have gained through this journey. Our journey outward may be tempting to rush to completion. That too is part of our learning and our growth in the labyrinth. How do we balance the need to complete with the desire to remain? Then finally we come to the last remaining bits of the path outward. There are but a few steps remaining and then we are no longer in the labyrinth. At this time, I encourage you to offer the fourth prayer of the labyrinth, a prayer of gratitude for the gifts received, for the life lived, for the things left behind, and for the strength for the future. I hope that you, too, um, can benefit and enjoy and grow from practicing the labyrinth. Thank you.